start recording now. So awesome. Jonathan, thank you so, so, so much for being here. This is our recording for the Ketogenic Living Certified Coaches, where we're going to be chatting about nutrition policy today because you, my friend, are an expert and I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm going to let you roll, Jonathan. You want to just introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Jonathan Posey. I am the founder and executive director of the Council of Holistic Health Educators. We are the only independent nonprofit advocacy organization representing the holistic health community. And that includes schools, practitioners, stakeholders. Uh, for example, we've got CrossFit uh, as one of our uh, stakeholders. We've got a lot of different schools that are part of the, the council. And what we do is just lobby uh, the different state governments. Sometimes we lobby the federal government to protect your rights uh, some of the ways that we do that is, for example, in New Jersey, they're trying to pass legislation that would require you to have a license to talk about food and nutrition, but you have to be a dietitian to get the license. So we're fighting against those types of um, encroachment on our rights, but yeah. we're also doing a lot to create pathways. So for example, in Missouri, Ohio, Florida, uh, and other states, we are fighting to introduce an exemption to the law, which says, hey, you want to talk about food and nutrition? You don't need a license at all. Uh, I came to this by way of a, uh, a few different ways. I started off in Congress uh, back, way back when uh, in Washington, D.C. I worked for a congressional committee. Uh, then after that, I went to a lobbying firm where I specialized in food and consumer safety. Uh, after that, I went down to Atlanta uh, to a nonprofit there. Um, there were a lot of ethical problems that really made me uncomfortable, so I just decided, you know what, I wanna do something completely different, do something more proactive. Uh, and actually I was dating, this is funny, I was dating a holistic practitioner at the time. And we moved to Georgia and she looks at the law and she's like, honey, I can't practice, fix it. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. and it, it really made me mad. Uh, when I read the law, it was like, you cannot be, provide any type of individualized nutrition assessment, guidance, sometimes education. I just thought these are dumb laws. This is mm -hmm. like, uh, monopolistic licensure type laws. So uh, I founded the council in 2017 and we are just rolling right along. You know what? I actually noticed um, the, like maybe last week or something that Florida was now an orange state and I was like, what? <laughs> so, I'm glad you mentioned that. The colors, the colors mean nothing. Okay. That, and, and, that, and that is completely backwards for most folks. Um, yeah. The colors were created by the Center for Nutrition Advocacy, which is actually a part of a very large umbrella organization that represents nutritionists, specifically nutritionists that get the CNS credential. Uh, mm -hmm. For them, the colors mean something. For the rest of us, the only color that matters is red, uh, and actually on the website, uh, holisticcouncil.org, we created a brand new map that is much easier because really for awesome. us, it's either yes or no. Yes, you can practice or no, you have to find a different pathway and we help you find that pathway. Uh, but Florida is still very much a red state, but we're suing the heck out of them. Uh, Good. And we'll take it all over to the Supreme, we are going to take it to the Supreme Court if we have to. Oh my gosh. Okay. So tell me how, what we can do um, if we do find ourselves in a red state. So if you find yourself, well, there's a couple of things. The first is that if your school is a member of the council mm -hmm. and you find yourself in a red state, give us a call. Uh, you can send an email, contact at holisticcouncil.org. Uh, you can use the contact form on the website. Uh, and if we need to, I'll schedule an appointment and we'll talk on the phone and I will go through the law step by step if I have to. I will go over your scope of practice with you. I will help you find those pathways to practice. Uh, that's the benefit that we provide all of our members. Uh, if you find yourself in a red state and your school is not a member of the council, then tell your school to be a member of the council. But okay, I'm going to join your council today. <laughs> yes. Yeah? So I, I can cover us. Help. I'm going to join your council today for us. How, I, I, we can have that discussion uh, offline, absolutely. But yeah. I'll, I'll tell you about a little about what that entails. So when I started the council, it was in January of 2017. I just come off of this other natural health nonprofit that mm -hmm. just had so many ethical problems. And so I thought, okay, 
how can I do something better? And the first thing I thought of is that there are so many nonprofits out there saying, Kate, give us money and trust us. Yes. And I thought that's not good enough. Not good enough anymore because there's too many of us out here. So I wanted to find a way to proactively give back to people who donate and to the council who become members of the council so that I came up with this phrase that still doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but it's, I want to provide a return on your advocacy investment. And the number one way we do that is that when a school joins the council, all of that school's students, alumni, and prospective students can reach out to us anytime. I'm looking at a sink. Whose sink is that? That's a great sink. <laughs> I just... <laughs> 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 yes, I'm going in the sink. Yeah. Uh, we're throwing in the kitchen sink. So what we do is we take on everyone. We take on your prospective students because we want them to feel safe and secure in enrolling in your school. It's a big investment. Mm -hmm. we our students, we also take on your alumni because, Kate, I meet folks every single day. They went to a holistic health school and they couldn't quite practice the way they wanted to. And after a few years, they gave up. Yeah. And I hate that. So I want to get those folks back working. Um, the other thing that we're, we, we do is we do webinars like this, nutrition webinars, uh, policy, advocacy, specific topics like HIPAA, lab testing, supplements, whatever you need. Uh, we help with marketing. We help with sales. Um, I, it's all about return on your advocacy investment because my full-time job is going out and lobbying. Uh, this month, so the month of August, I was in Tallahassee, Austin, Cleveland, um, Trenton, and Albany, New York. Wow. Lobbying with legislators, talking with policymakers uh, to make sure we protect our rights. So that's like the thing we do is fighting for your rights, defending our rights, and proactively pushing for new rights. But so that's that. But then yeah. the rest of what we want to do is to help our members grow. Because if our schools are growing, that means there's more practitioners uh, in the field, which we can talk about in our discussions, and there's more practitioners I can train to become advocates. Yes. So yep. uh, that, and we also, a couple other things is that we're very transparent uh, in how we do things. All of our members are right there on the website. Uh, the bigger the school, the more money you pay. Uh, mm -hmm. to Council, it's not a lot of money. You know, we try to keep it very low. Um, and foremost, we just want to help our schools grow. Oh, absolutely. And I absolutely love this. I'm so, I'm so happy that you're here and that we can affiliate with you. <laughs> Yay. Um, I, I'm actually going to fill this out because I don't want to type while we're talking, but I'm filling <laughs> your application. Um, and like, I will just give you all my money to like help us, you know, because we really believe in what you're doing and we want to protect everybody. Why are, why are these policies? in place as they are. You mentioned kind of just being like this like weird monopoly of. It, it, it all started in the 80s. Mm. The late 80s, um, it, it, it's, it's the dietitians, And, and yeah. I have to preface that by saying there are a ton of wonderful dietitians. For all, sure. We all work with dietitians. There are many great dietitians out there. But the Dietetics Association, Trade Association, the Academy for Nutrition of Dietetics has a credential called the registered dietitian, the RD credential. If there's no extra benefit to that credential, no one's going to get it. Why mm -hmm. become an RD? Why spend the money, take the test, renew it every year if you don't need it? So we see that a lot with all board credentials. If there is a, if there's a board credential, they got to find some way to add value to that board credential because people are not going to keep renewing it. Yeah. So the dietitians in the late 80s started going around to the different state legislators and they would say, you know, Congresswoman, uh, or I'm sorry, Representative, because uh, Congress is Washington, Representative, uh, we are the only people who are trained to talk about food and nutrition. There are so many snake oil salesmen out there, people who are selling fad diets who don't know what they're talking about and they're mm -hmm. killing people. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics managing director or something, he said on the phone to me in New Jersey, you just want people to die. What? He said, I, I said to him, I said, where is the third party factual data to back up the need for licensure of nutrition professionals in New Jersey? Where's the numbers? Where's the wow. public 
thing. And he's like, oh, you just want a dead body. Is that it? And then he said, you just want people to die. So that's how they feel about us. But they feel that way about us because in the 80s, the dietetics lobby went to all these states and they said, look, you've got to pass a law to protect the public. This is a public health crisis. Dietitians are the only ones properly trained to provide advice, assessment, guidance, education on food and nutrition. But really, Representative, really the problem is, is that it needs to be a registered dietitian because we, because we are the only ones who know what we're doing about this, we are the only ones that can decide who really is trained and qualified. So when you have a law that says, like Florida, in order to talk about food and nutrition, uh, to do an individualized, that's important, food and nutrition assessment, et cetera, you must be licensed. Well, you can't be licensed unless you get the registered dietitian credential, unless you pay, <laughs> unless you pay. Yeah, um, yeah. That. So that's how we got to that point, is they were just like, you know, people are not buying this RD credential. And so we've got to keep it going. And it's interesting, uh, I can't prove this because it's, con it's kind of confidential, but the RD numbers are really low in states that don't require a license. The dietitians are like, wow. Well, I don't need it to do my job, why bother getting it? So that means the academy is really dependent on those red states and keeping those licensure laws or else the dietitians are going, you know what? I've been doing this for 20 years or 15 years or 10 years as a dietitian. I've got a great job. I've got a great practice. I don't need the RD credential anymore. Mm -hmm. so they, yeah. stop. <laughs> so that's, that's really what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen that too. I've seen that happen with people that I'm on their email list where yeah. they're, they're not renewing for several reasons because of that and because they don't believe with what they have to teach. Yeah. I mean, so, a lot of board credentials that don't have a legal backing, it's good for marketing. It's good to say, hey, I'm board certified. But I think the public kind of looks at board certified and it just goes over their head because yeah. mm -hmm. everyone is board certified, so to speak. So kind of goes over their head. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's just, there's no reason to do it. It's a good marketing thing, but becoming board certified or an RD unless you need it for your job or need it for your practice, uh, there's really no re reason to do it. So that's why they're fighting us tooth and nail. And you had mentioned that there, there is a big difference between individualized yes. care. Can um, you talk about that? Well, I want to also add on the licensure, yeah. we see this also, did you know that in some states you have to have a license to be an interior decorator? What in the what? You have to have a license to be an interior decorator. You have to have a license to braid hair. You have to have a license. In, in, in Louisiana, you had to have a license to build a coffin uh, until the Institute for Justice sued on behalf of some, of, a, of, a, um, of some Benedictine monks, I think, who built coffin. I mean, it, it's silly. Oh my gosh. It, it's about propping up an industry. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, your question, please, again. Oh, individualized. Yeah. Okay, so there's two paradigms that a practitioner will face. If you're in a state like Virginia, where I live, we have no law that restricts the practice of nutrition. So that means if I went to you and said, hey, Kate, I wanna lose weight. By the way, I'm on keto, it's great, it's working. Mm -hmm. uh, Kate, I wanna lose weight. And you'll say, okay, Jonathan, here are, let's talk about what you eat, what you don't like to eat, what was your, what was your family history growing up, what you eat growing up, um, you know, what are your health problems? Are you allergic to anything? Okay, now we've got all of that. Uh, I can do an assessment. I can provide you with individualized meal plans. I can provide you with individualized support. That's okay to do in a state like Virginia. But in a state like Florida, you can't because the license says that only a licensed person can provide the individualized stuff. So because of that, we have to fall back on what is called general health and wellness. It's a weird catch-all term that basically means if what you're providing can be found in a book, mm -hmm. journal, article, blog, YouTube video, lecture, it's fair game. It's just in how you present that information. So instead of saying, John, all right, you want to lose weight? Uh, here's your individualized stuff. What instead you could do is, here's a book on keto, here's information on keto, here are cookbooks that you can get, here are resources uh, for the ketogenic diet, um, and, I, and you can support me 
uh, as like a peer mentor, you know, and be the buddy uh, on that type of thing. And as, as I have questions, you can provide me with answers. Uh, it's a really weird fine line. And sometimes there's so much crossover, you know, that, that it just gets weird. But that's basically what you have to do because you're, we, we at the council want to protect you from that one person, that undercover sting operation, like what happened in Florida. Yeah. An undercover agent comes to you because dietitian, a dietitian has filed a complaint. And so the state is obligated to investigate. They send an undercover investigator and the practitioner says, so Kate, tell me, what do you like to eat? What do you don't like to eat? Well, you've just done a nutritional assessment and now you violated the law. So it's wacky. You know, it's absolutely that is really weird. So wait, could we, but can we can still have them fill out client intake forms or no? Technically it depends on what's in that client intake form. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, uh, you can ask very broad questions. Like, are you allergic to anything? I think that is one thing that, that you can ask without fear. But as soon as you start asking about what do you eat, what do you don't like to eat, do you take supplements, do you have a family history uh, of medical problems, you know, a little check, yes, no, yes, no, uh, of family medical, you're doing an assessment. Mm -hmm. and it depends on where you're at, uh, whether or not they're gonna come after you. Some states don't even care. Um, you know, so, some states we've seen where, where the Dietetics Council, the Dietetics Board, uh, just really doesn't hardly exists. Like we just flipped Maine a few months ago. We were working with the Health Freedom Network and a group of herbalists, uh, and they flipped the state of Maine. And they were able to flip the state of Maine because the state of Maine's Board of Dietetics they didn't meet for a whole year. And oh, so, wow. like, this is useless. If you're not even going to have meetings and not even going to monitor the industry, why are we even having this law on the books? So some states don't care they're not active but other states like ohio and florida are super active they're constantly looking uh to come down on someone because they want to justify their existence so yeah. when you give that questionnaire you have to be careful depending on which state you're in about what questions that you're asking so here's the question then like what if what if our business is registered and licensed in mm -hmm like a non-red state uh -huh. but we work online and one of the clients that we're working with is located in a red state would we need to change the questionnaire nope that's a okay. really great question so there's there's two schools of thought on telepractice and the one school of thought is tied to medicare uh, is tied to the licensed healthcare community in medicare uh, the medicare rules uh, in some states say that uh, it's dependent on where the client is located but because we're dealing with nutrition and we're dealing with a very patchwork of laws across the country, I prefer that it is based on where you are located. Because what I, again, want to protect is I want to protect you from who's going to come knocking on your door. If you're in Colorado working with someone in Florida, the, it would take such an enormous effort for the state of Florida to come after you that I would, I would be so happy because I would take that to the bank in PR, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it would absolutely be hilarious. Uh, and for that, they're, they're almost certainly never going to do it. So because the bar is just too high for someone in Florida to go after someone in Colorado, but let's reverse that. You're in Florida. You're working with someone in Colorado. By the way, Colorado has no law whatsoever governing nutrition. I still worry that the dietetics council is gonna come after you, and if some dietitian finds out that you're working online, they're gonna report you, and you're gonna get a knock at the door. And that's what I'm afraid of. So, okay. yeah. I say it's where you're physically located, because as mm -hmm. I've been told, you're still practicing dietetics without a license. Okay, so then if we are in a red state, which I've taken, I've dropped your, um, the Holistic Health Council's organ, um, website cool. into the chat box so everyone can go on there because you have your map right there on the home page right on the click right on. hand side yep yeah, it's right there on. i think click on it again you get a there's an analysis of every single state oh awesome so if you are in a red state you are going to need for now anyway until we get <laughs> until jonathan and all of us like really make some changes here um you're going to need to update your client intake form to read to take out like any questions about 
medications, foods, things like that, and just ask if they have any food allergies. Is that that'll yeah, protect us? Okay. That, that's that's the safest thing. And as you get to know your client, you're gonna uncover those other things. They're gonna say them, and, and you can't prevent what they tell you. It's just what you're asking of them. That's okay, a, that's, that's such a good point. point. Yeah. Um, and as we get to know the clients and the clients get to know us, they tend to open up and talk more. Uh, I, think a, I think a lot of clients, as from what I remember, come in and go, yeah, you know, I got heart disease or I got diabetes. Uh-huh, yeah. They just volunteer. And what they volunteer is not your fault. Um, and, but I would ask them who their primary care physician is. I think that's- Yes, absolutely. And we always advise them um, to, you know, we, our disclaimer is like, hey, like I'm, this is not di meant to diagnose or treat you and, you know, yes. share with your medical professional. Yeah, um, we are not treating you. And we do too advise um, not to provide individualized like meal plans and prescribe them and things like that. Like, hey, this is a, you know, these are some suggested menus and things like that. If you want to follow them, cool. If not, don't, but you know, yeah. here's a resource. And also it's, it's, once you ask that question, I think about, and at first I'm not a lawyer, I'm not licensed to diagnose, treat or cure a legal condition. But I know that, from my policy work as a lobbyist, as, as working in the legislature, that if you ask that client, who's your primary care physician and what is their contact information, and then you reach out to that doctor and say, hey, just wanna let you know, I'm working with your patient. Uh, can you give me a background on them? You know, is there anything I should be aware of? If the doctor is telling you that, whole different ballgame, because that's a licensed yeah. healthcare provider telling you, whole different ball game. You can ask the doctor anything I need to be aware of. Do they have any kind of medications I should be aware of? Anything like that. So that's kind of a back door. It's just what you're asking the client is what you have to be careful of. Okay. Isn't that, isn't that weird? It, it's so weird. It's so weird, but I'm so glad that like you're here and you're explaining this to us. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. How can individuals support you and support this cause? Oh, I love that question. I, I, I actually asked Charles if it was okay to make a pitch for donations, which- Oh my God, yes. That's how we, that's how we were funded through you, through the public. Uh, just go to our website and, and click support us. There's a wonderful uh, donation page. Every little dime helps. I can't emphasize that enough. And a great example is when I sent uh, 185 letters to the legislature of New Jersey. You know, $25, $50, that buys postage. Uh, we've run a very lean operation, uh, no high salaries, things like that. We, our 990, I think, is out there now. We just published a 990. Um, give us a small donation. We'd be extremely grateful. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. We're going to, I'm going to actually, you know, post this, obviously, in the coaches group. You, you and I are going to talk because I'm going to send yeah. you money and join. Um, and I'm going to have everybody donate uh, or we'll ask, you know, for donations. Um, I want to be able to put your logo, too, up on our website. Because Absolutely. I think that's really super important too. Charles had a really great question um, with regards to um, working with doctors mm -hmm. and, and asking them about patients. How would that how would that work with HIPAA? Oh, great question. Uh, so we're we're working on revamping a document that, that we had out there for a while called working with a licensed healthcare provider. Uh, because the council represents such a wide breadth of practitioners. We have, we have health coaches, we have holistic nutritionists, uh, we have a bunch of different folks. We, uh, we're undertaking a rewrite of working with a licensed healthcare professional. In terms of working with that licensed healthcare professional, it depends on what state you're in. And I'll get to the HIPAA questions, it's totally separate from HIPAA. Uh, it depends on what state you're in and what the parameters are of working with that licensed healthcare professional. Now, as far as HIPAA is concerned, HIPAA is about the confidentiality of transmitted information for the purposes of billing. And we actually have a HIPAA uh, white paper, which I'll send over to you after the call, but it, it's basically this. Yet there's, there's two prongs to whether or not you have to worry about HIPAA. And it's, the first one is that, are you billing them? Are you, are you doing insurance reimbursement? If you are not doing insurance reimbursement, HIPAA doesn't apply. If you are in the, in the habit of transmitting confidential medical information for the purposes of billing, HIPAA doesn't apply. 
So if you're working with a licensed healthcare provider, they've already got a HIPAA program in place because they bill insurance and they've got medical records and they've got a system. So you can just, I would use their system. But if you're an individual practitioner, HIPAA really doesn't apply unless you're billing insurance. Mm, okay. All right. That's good to know. It's I know little, like, it's complicated. It's a little, yeah, no, it is. It is. Um, and I know, so Jennifer had mentioned that she's got, uh, you know, some of us have different licenses mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to overstep bounds of <laughs> license. Yeah. Um, so what, what do we have to do with our coaching practice if HIPAA applies? If HIPAA does apply, you need to have an encrypted email system. Uh, you need to make sure that communication between you and the client and the billing company, or the insurance company is encrypted. Um, all, for all intensive purposes, uh, Gmail were, is encrypted. All, I think, email providers are encrypted. Uh, but there are special email systems out there that are more HIPAA compliant. Uh, and you just have to find one and choose one so that all your communications are encrypted. HIPAA is about the transfer of medical information and making sure that information is confidential and protected. That's all it is. Because HIP, when HIPAA came out, HIPAA came out 15, 20 years ago, it seems like. And it was all about, you know, internet, medical billing going over the internet. So they just wanted to make sure it was confidential. Okay. I think, so we, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Jonathan, Nutra Admin. Um, it's a, it's a, it's like an online, you know, system for nutrition professionals. Um, and we have like a little special offer with them. Nutra Admin systems encrypted as well. Um, and they have things where you can invoice, bill, and keep track of all of your client communications. Um, Excellent. That would be something. That's all yeah. you need to do about HIPAA. Uh, it, it, it's really a, do you, do you bill insurance? or not. Mm, okay. HIPAA, I think HIPAA, if I remember correctly, was really created because of Medicare, uh, because of billing Medicare uh, and transmission over the internet of that stuff. But I'll send you the white paper. It goes into a little bit more detail and specifically lays it out. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Jonathan? You can type them into the chat and we'll grab them. This is like, this has just been so awesome. Thank um, you. Yeah. so happy to be able to, to support you too. And the funny part is, is every time a school like yours joins the council, that gives me access to all of your graduates to then turn them into rapid advocates. Oh now, yeah. Um, and actually, so um, I also work with some other wellness professionals to help them get their certification courses up and running. So I will definitely be sharing this opportunity with them to join. Yeah, yeah that's, that's how we flipped North Carolina. We had That's six, amazing. At the end of the day, we had 60 holistic practitioners from, I think, seven different schools. We started with three very timid and shy three people, and we, tr we provided them with the training. We provided them with white papers, talking points. Uh, we provided them with legislation. I helped them set up the meetings with their legislators, gave them everything they needed, and just slowly but surely, they just kept getting bigger and bigger to where on the last days of passing that legislation, we had like a half a dozen practitioners going to Raleigh almost every day, going to the Capitol, talking to legislators, you know, nagging the snot out of them uh, until they finally did it. And at like 10 o'clock at night, right after they approved the funding for the Willy Worm Festival, they voted unanimously to pass a new law that gave us this great exemption in North Carolina and turn it into a green state. Amazing. It's Amazing. You. It's you that is really where the power lies. I can do tons of work from DC. I can do tons of prep work, scheduling. I can do all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, what really is going to change these state laws is practitioners saying, all right, let's do this. And we do it. Yay. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> love, love, love it. I love it. Um, Okay, Kimberly said she's in a red state. Which state? North Dakota, right? Right, North Kimberly? Dakota. I was in Fargo in February. I was in, we had legislation introduced uh, in North Dakota. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we, we weren't successful through the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually a legislator there whose fiance was a holistic practitioner. And North Dakota really loves its licensure laws. I mean, they really love them. 
uh, and it was tough. We were there in negative 30 degree weather uh, and we made the best case we can. CrossFit was with us um, and just we couldn't do it. But that's, that's the nature though of legislation, of policy. It takes a long time. Uh, when you hire a lobbyist, if you're a company and you hire a lobbyist, typically the contract is for a year because it takes a long time to warm up a legislator, warm up the committee, get people on board uh, to turn a tie, especially, yeah. if you're trying to, especially if you're engaging in what they call turf wars, which is what we, what we are doing. So, um, and all we're asking for is this exemption. This is, this is a very important point, Kate. We're not asking for licensure for ourselves. That is a hill that is so, that's a mountain that we, were, we are not going to be able to conquer for at least another 10 years. And we're not gonna be able to get licensure for ourselves because one, we don't have the numbers, we don't have you know, 150 people showing up to a hearing, we don't have 150 practitioners begging their legislators to get the licensure. So we still need to get organized. The second is that if we try to get licensure, we're gonna have the doctors, the nurses, the naturopaths, everyone coming after us. Uh, and opposing us, because if we get licensure, it dilutes their licensure, as they, that's how they see it. Um, and it costs a lot of money and time. So only thing we're asking for, when we, like in North Dakota, in Montana, uh, in Missouri, uh, this, just back this past February, is that we want an exemption to the licensure law that says, look, so long as you don't attempt to diagnose, treat, or cure a disease, and you don't call yourself licensed, you're okay to practice. We got that in North Carolina, and that was amazing. And that's all we're asking for, because if we get the exemption, we can then put people to work, and the more practitioners we have working, the more down the road we're able to start asking for. If we've got, if, if I had 200 practitioners in the state of Florida who were willing to step up to the plate and help lobby with me and help work on this with me, we wouldn't even need to worry about licensure. I would just take them and go to the legislature, get the exemption passed, and then we'd go over to the major insurance companies and say, look, I've got 200 practitioners here who are helping the 20 million Floridians to eat, live, and feel better. You know, they're trying to lower healthcare costs. They're trying to lower the dependence on medication. This is a no-brainer for the insurance company. So we just got to get those numbers up. Yeah, absolutely. And in those cases, though, like for you know somebody like Kim who's in North Dakota, because she is offering like online coaching services, right? Uh -huh. In a client intake form that she'll just ask, you know, if people are allergic to peanuts or something, you know, or what are they allergic to, if yeah. anything. Um, she can basically say like all the information that she's giving them is online. They can find it yep. by themselves. Yep. So um, it would be still like fair game if she's like, hey, yep. This is, this is, you can yeah. look up these. Oh. These are some recipes that I found. You can also find them online. You know, here's some YouTube videos. Yeah, and it's, it's an interesting dichotomy between those who have become holistic nutritionists and they want to be a nutritionist. They want to call themselves a holistic nutritionist. They want to help people to eat, live, and feel better. But they're in a place like North Dakota. And unfortunately, in North Dakota, you can't practice up to the level of your education and training. Mm -hmm. so in a way, you almost have to become a health coach. And that's not saying one is better than the other or one is more trained than the other. It's just because of the law, we have to modify how you approach things. And okay. yeah. when, we, when I speak to legislators, I'm always speaking with one voice because they don't see us as Ayurvedic herbalists nutrition, holistic nutritionist, health coach. They just see us as unlicensed people wanting to practice where there is a license. They don't care or really want to get into what are you, what are you, what are you, what's your scope, what is your education, what is your credential. They just see it very plainly as licensed, unlicensed. That's it. So a lot of folks who go through programs, they don't want to call themselves a health coach sometimes. You know, they, they have gotten a different type of a title. They have another uh, credential that they feel they want to work under. Totally fine. It's just sometimes we got to modify based on the law uh, until we can get the numbers up and get the exemption passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So a couple of coaches are saying like they're a little afraid um, of like what to say. <laughs> That's, 
And I'm sorry, could you clarify that afraid to say it to their clients or afraid to say to a legislator? Because there's, um, there's a difference there. Okay. I'll wait for that. But like what you're afraid to say. Um, I'll, I'll jump on it because that, it, it's a good point. We yeah. have a lot of folks who are afraid to go talk to their legislators. They're afraid to call up their state senator or their state representative uh, because they're afraid of, of drawing attention to themselves. You know, the, the, the squeaky wheel or, or what, you know, a, a nail sticking up gets hammered down. And that is, that's something you never have to worry about. And we can, we can just simply look to the cannabis legislation out there. Right. There yep. So yep. many stoners who've gone to their legislator and say, I grow in my backyard and smoke four times a day. I think we should legalize it. Mm -hmm. The legislator is never going to rat you out, ever. Uh, it would be a PR disaster for them. They're never yeah. going to do that. Uh, you can speak openly with your legislator, but people are afraid. They are afraid if they show up to the committee hearing when our legislation is being considered that the, suddenly the dietitians are gonna turn the focus on them. Um, I think the more vocal you are, the more open you are, the safer you make yourself. Mm, okay, so um, our friend in North Dakota and, and any other red state has asking if she becomes a certified nutritionist with like the ISSA. Um, I'm not sure who the ISSA is. So uh, International Sports and Science Association. Okay, there's only one credential recognized and that's the RD. Okay. Okay. So, in, yeah. in, some, in some states, they the CNS credential, like in North North Carolina, the reason why we were able to pass the legislation in North Carolina is because first we they were sued. The Institute for Justice sued the state of North Carolina, and so then the dietitians were basically dragged to the table, kicking and screaming uh, that they had to change the law now, or they were going to get sued again. So we had the dietitians saying, "Okay, fine, do it." We had the nutritionists who said, hey, we want licensure too. We've got masters. We've oh, okay. We've got a credential we need to make money with. So we want to be licensed. So the grand bargain was dietitians, nutritionists, and the holistic professionals. But at the end of the day, it was us. We were the ones that made this happen. It was a holistic pr practitioner that actually pushed this legislation through. So unfortunately, so with North Carolina, she with North Carolina, if you have the CNS credential or the RD credential, you can be licensed. And I think in Florida, with, with um, there's a narrow pathway that if you have a CNS, you can eventually become licensed. Um, but you know, for the rest of the red states, you can only be an RD. It is the definition of a monopoly. Oh yeah, absolutely. And like you said, we're not saying we wanna be licensed, we're just saying yeah. We want, to, we want to be able to practice and save people's lives. Yeah. And, and licensure, it's, it's really silly because the reason why people hang on, the reason why practitioners like an RD hang, wants to hang on to their license is because insurance reimbursement is based on licensure. And the insurance companies will only reimburse if you're licensed in that state, which is a whole different paradigm that we're working on because it's really dumb. Um, it should be, I think, individual. You should be able to call up Blue Cross Blue Shield and say, look, I am a holistic practitioner. Here is my education, my credentials, and they should be able to approve you. That's really what it, it, it should be yeah. like. Mm -hmm. So we're working in that direction. We're working to try to get rid of licensure and completely from some of these things like nutrition, where it's just not needed. Uh, right. and, and, and really create a better, a better pathway, a better paradigm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I think like you just, you, you made such good points too with like how some states are requiring you to be, you know, to have a license to be an interior decorator. And I know Charles was, um, <laughs> had mentioned before that some are requiring you to have a license in order to be a, a life coach and like, yeah. yeah well, life coach, life coach. So uh, at, the, at the present, there is none, but Oregon, a couple of years ago, when we first started, uh, Oregon was trying to pass an emergency legislation requiring that if you want to be a health coach, life coach, sex coach, sleep coach, you got to have a license. It was completely bonkers. It was a very bad written legislation. Uh, I had everyone from Nike to the AFL-CIO reigning holy hell on the state of Oregon over that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's silly. I, I think the next one that, that people are trying to push, like diabetes educators, uh, the American mm -hmm. Association of Diabetes Educators, they have a certification as a diabetes educator. 
Mm -hmm. They're trying to get states to pass a legislation that says, hey, if you want to educate about diabetes, you got to have this credential and you have to be licensed. It, wow. it's, it's all just money. That, that's all it is. But yeah, interior decorator, um, hair braiding, making coffins. What are some of the other wacky ones that are out there that, that are like, nope, got to have a license for that. It's, yeah, well, it's, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of like certifications popping up, like, mm -hmm. like mindset, cash, ca there's a cash injection coach certification. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I get a lot, I get a lot of things that come across my email. Yeah. Um, and they're all, and you know, these, not all, but like some of these, um, these, you know, providers or whatever have, have gone through and, you know, affiliated with organizations like say like the International Coach Federation yeah. to become recognized or approved. And it's just, I, I don't know that it matters state by state. No, uh, it, it is interesting. We're, I, I just assume that wherever you see a credential that mm -hmm. you have to pay for, it's a natural thing to want to try to find a way to add value to that credential. 1000%. And so it, it's, a, it's a very natural thing that if you have an organization or an association with a credential that you have to pay for, uh, eventually someone, a lobbyist, is going to go to them and say, hey, or, or someone on the board or someone there is going to go, we've plateaued. You know, we've got X number of people and we're starting to see declines. We've got to find a way to amp this up and, and keep people because we can't, we, we're not going to have the money. So they're going to be owned, but the only way to do that is to get legislation, to make it a law. Uh, but the tide is completely turning. Uh, against that. Uh, you just look at IJ.org, the Institute for Justice. You know, they, they're a huge organization. I facetiously call them our lawyers because one of the other benefits to being a member of the council is that, Kate, if one of your graduates gets a letter from, a, from say, North Dakota that says, excuse me, we got a report that you're practicing without a license or you get a call from an investigator, mm -hmm. call us. Call us. We'll connect you with a pro bono attorney. And if we have to, we'll sue. You know, I will walk you through as I, as you remember in the, I think the, uh, uh, the last webinar I did on advocacy uh, and nutrition licensure and laws, if you get a letter or, you know, if you get a call from an investigator or an investigator shows up at your practice, rule number one, say nothing, admit nothing. Ooh. Rule number two, admit nothing. Rule number three, Say, thank you very much for letting me know. I would like to have in writing what the charge is, what law I'm violating specifically, how the determination was made. I want that in writing. Uh, and then hang up the phone. Just hang up on them. Say, thank you. Have a nice day. And then call me. Call your school or call me because eventually you're going to get to me. And right. we'll take it from there. I will find out what's going on. I will walk you through what you need to do. If we need a lawyer, I'll bring in an attorney who can help us decide how best to respond. Okay, amazing. Um, amazing. For those who are in red states, if they can't use the term coaching, what could they say? They can say coaching. Okay. There's nothing against that. They're, the only thing you can't use is in the red states, the word dietitian. Dietitian, licensed. Oh, dietitian. okay. Registered dietitian. Yeah. The other, the other word, the other word is nutritionist. In some of those states, both green and red, you can't use the word, the occupational title, nutritionist. For example, Washington, the state of Washington has a certification law. That means that there is no restriction on the practice of nutrition. But if you wish to voluntarily become recognized by the state of Washington as a certified nutritionist, you can apply to get that certification. And then you have the exclusive privilege of calling yourself a nutritionist. There's only a few states like that. The vast majority of the states, you can call yourself a nutritionist and there's no problem. That's another white paper I will send you after the call. Um, so really, I mean, the term coach, that's easy. You can call yourself a coach anywhere. Yeah, okay, right. So I could be like a baby wrangling coach right now. Yes. You can call yourself a holistic <laughs> practitioner. A yeah. holistic Perfect. wellness wellness professional. If you if you can't use the yeah. right nutritionist, yeah. swap it out for wellness. I love that. I love, love, love that. Um, anything that I haven't asked you or guys, any other questions for Jonathan? 
I am so, so, so grateful for you, my friend. I, for the work that you're doing, for the time that you spent with us today, for this incredible amount of information. I am so, so happy to support you. I want to blast you out to my email list, on my website. Like, we really got to get the word out. You guys, we got to get on the street. We got to get the word out. I think um, the, the only thing I'd, I'd like to close with is that, you know, we are the council of holistic health educators. We are made up of different schools, different modalities, different practitioners. Uh, we are agnostic in our view of things. The reason, really the, the reason why the council came about was because we had these states that were trying to pass legislation to restrict the rights of holistic practitioners to just work. And so we kind of have to have this umbrella organization where we have all the different schools because you can't do it alone. You know, to, to hire a lobbyist, which we're about to hire a lobbyist in New Jersey. For a single school to hire a lobbyist for the state of New Jersey, that's a really tough, high, expensive bar that some schools are just going to go, why am I paying for this? You know, there are five, six, seven, ten dozen other schools with practitioners here. You know, the only way we're going to defend ourselves, the only way we're going to pass these laws is by joining together, pooling our resources, and fighting as one. And so that's, that's really what I want to emphasize. And so that's why I'm very grateful for all of our school members, no matter where they come from, no matter what their practice is, uh, it's extremely grateful to be willingness to say, all right, I'm willing to come together for the greater good. Love, 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 love. Oh, Jennifer does have a quick question. Um, for online educators, do you recommend having an LLC? Of is course. It, okay. Of course. And, and if okay. I could plug... If I could plug this one person, uh, her name is Lisa Fraley. LisaFraley.com, F-R-A-L-E-Y. Lisa uh, is our quasi-general counsel. She's the attorney that I call whenever I need something done. Uh, she's an attorney and a health coach based in the state of Maine. She runs a legal coaching business. And she has templates for uh, client intake forms for your specific state. She can help you create an LLC. She, Lisa Fraley was the one that helped us do all the paperwork to become a 501c4 nonprofit. Uh, Lisa's really, really wonderful. Uh, so, you know, definitely check out Lisa. Uh, I also say that, you know, when it comes to attorneys, um, you really don't need to hire a lawyer. In fact, I would advise against hiring a lawyer for a lot of this stuff, because uh, that's what we're here for. We're just, the lawyer's going to do what I do, read the law and go over it with you. Um, LegalZoom is another great place to just form an LLC. It's like a hundred bucks, I think, to form an LLC. But yeah, you should definitely, in my opinion, not as a lawyer, not as a business coach, to, it just, it's safer that way, I think. Oh, I, I agree. Yeah. I was, uh, I've told my group before, my accountant told me um, not to even form an LLC until I had hit a certain income level. But in oh. mind, but I, and I'm in Florida, but in hindsight, yeah. I wish I would have just done it sooner just to get it out of the way, you know, because as soon as I did, it was like, oh my God, I got to file like all this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's I, good, I good protection. it's good legal protection. And Lisa, yeah. will actually, she has a, um, a, a, a legal chat where she'll talk to you for 15 minutes for free. And so you can say, hey, do I really need an LLC? And she'll tell you yes or no based on, you know, your parameters. Lisa's That's awesome. Mom, yeah. I'll reach out to her too um, and bring her and see if she wants to come in and, and do something with us too. I'd be happy to. She, she, she will talk about the chakras awesome. and the legal love. She's amazing. Awesome. Oh my God. I'm definitely going to reach out to her and I'll, I'll use your name <laughs> and say that we just spoke to you, but that's phenomenal. Jonathan, I am going to um, message you privately to yeah. get my organization, you know, as one of your members to donate to you as well. Sure. Um, when we post this, um, Recording into the coaches group. I'm going to include your website when mm -hmm. you send me the white favorite papers I'm going to upload them as well and make sure everyone is aware of, the, of what you're doing and how we can support you I'll tell you what here's yeah. a better here's another idea. Okay, everyone listening to this if you graduated from Kate's program Reach if you have a question reach out. It's contact in fact here. I'll, ch I'll type in the chat window. I think I can do yes. I can okay contact. Oh, he's adorable uh, Holistic oh, Fun. <laughs> sure contact at holisticcouncil.org. Uh, it will go into our ticketing system and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, 
go ahead and start reaching out to us. All of your alumni, everyone, let's just go ahead and start anything we can do to help. Oh my God, here, like, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we, we so appreciate you. We so, I just, I know I speak for <laughs> more than 300 coaches now on six continents of the world. We appreciate you so much. Thank, thank you, you thank you, much. thank you for your time. Thank, thank you for everything that you're doing. We cannot wait to get involved. Thank you, thank you, thank I you. Thank you very much. I'll Good luck to with you. your house closing today. <laughs> oh my gosh, it is, it is, oh, it is so stressful, but it's like, whew, I'm Absolutely, <laughs> no, we'll, uh, we'll, I'll be saying prayers for you that it goes well thank for you, you today. <laughs> thank you very, very much. And let's, we can talk later today by phone yes. or we we'll have some time. I would love that. Thank you so much. Coaches, thanks you guys for joining. And, and you know what? Please reach out to Jonathan if you need him. Yeah. Please mm -hmm. donate. This is a huge, huge, huge cost for all of us. All of us who are just on the ground trying to save some lives here. Thank you very much for saying that. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.